Welcome to this week's Cattle Call. I'm Susan Littlefield on the Rural Radio Network. We're broadcasting from the 80th Annual Convention of the National Association of Farm Broadcasters. So you're going to hear lots of noise around us because, you know, a room of farm broadcasters is not a very quiet place. But a lot of things happening within this market trade that we're going to dive into. The Cattle on Feed Report, if you remember to last week's episode, by the way, thank you for all the folks that commented about last week's haunting of the Cattle on Feed Report. Unfortunately, is that haunting continuing as we have another report coming out on Friday? Are we going to be butting heads with this report? We're going to find out those details. We're going to look at some technical and fundamentals. Also, we're going to talk a little about a birthday trade. What do we see? Where we need to be come mid-December? Lots to look at. We've got lots to talk about. As you see, Brad Coima joins us. He is with Coima Coima Varlick out of Sioux Center, Iowa. So let's talk about this cattle on feed report. I mean, we had such a continued repeat of this report that other reports seem to come and die, and this one did not want to do so. You know, I'm sorry. You know what I want to say? I'm going to say it anyway. You know, I'll clean it up. Yeah, okay. The last cattle and feed report reminds me of um, um, someone having uh, gastrointestinal difficulties in church, right? It never goes away. It, you know, it's uh, there. Okay. Okay. Um, you're absolutely right. Thanks for having me on, Susan. It's fun to be on with you always. Um, and I can imagine what a, a noisy group you've got there for sure. Um, the cattle on feed, you know, just hung um, in the air like, uh, you know, I thought since the last report, because everyone was kind of like going like, well, heck, how is this possible? We kill 4%. The year to date slaughter is 4.7% less than a year. How can you have more cattle on feed? And then, you know, you start to get some of these preliminary guesses for this report that's coming out Friday. And so it's like, I, there's no question in my mind that for some anyway, it really turned the psychology. It really changed the perspective a lot of people had in the market and seemed to, you know, start that whole, or, or you know, we had we were off the highs by ways, but certainly triggered another $10, $12 break in the futures market. So, you know, waiting anxiously for this next report, I just wanted to give you a minute here to put some of this in perspective because I got people calling me and saying like, geez, Brad, they're guessing 106%. Uh, on the placement number, and they are. That's the average trade guess. That's what we're going to compare to Friday. Um, and they go, how can that be? Uh, you know, and, and I say, well, it can be because we're placing heifers still. It can be because we've had a tremendous increase in the number of Mexican imports. To a lesser degree, we've got some Canadian imports. And I think we're placing cattle ahead of time because the guy that owns the feeder cattle loves the price, right? He likes this high price feeder market, calf market, and he's been aggressively trying to sell his cattle on time. But now here, for the sake of having some perspective, reports are year on year comparisons. A year ago, the placement number in October was a record low, the record low. So we're comparing to a very, very, very small number. Another way of saying it, if we would come in at the guess of 106%, that number would still be 4% below the five-year average. So, okay, take a breath, everybody. Um, that this, this isn't quite the, oh my gosh, I was wrong with everything I thought, you know, type of a, a, a deal. Put it in perspective, look at what the historical deal is. Um, I, you know, the, the part of the, 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 the part of the uh, macro, if you want to call it the cycle thing that still, I think find fascinating is the fact that we're not rebuilding yet. Um, not at all. And, uh, you know, the, we'll see once here as we move forward, whether we see any heifer calf, the calf thing retention, but we certainly didn't see it in the yearland type deal. So now I have heard reported and I, I would be curious, I haven't talked to much down there in Nebraska, but when I talk across the Dakotas, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, I, I, I do hear a pretty consistent conception problem, a low, very, very poor pregnant uh, a preg check deal here, especially on first calf heifers, blaming the extreme heat. Um, things like that. So all of that plays into this deal. But I just wanted to give a little perspective to the guy out there that just hears a number of going like 6% more. Oh my gosh. You know, put it in perspective of what, what we've been doing the last several of years. So when you look at all, all the categories and we talk about, you know, the heifer numbers and the concerns that we saw in last month's report and the questioning came, what is the one area that you think could cause the markets the most stress? once those numbers are released and we have the weekend to kind of digest them. Well, I think if we have another round where the placements stay big across all weight categories, first of all, you know, that was the thing about the last one. I, 
I would have been a little more tolerant had that shown, uh, you know, a big increase in the number of lightweight cattle, particularly in Texas where they still dry. Mexico is still suffering from a drought where you're still plowing in all these lightweight calves. Um, the, uh, excuse me, the, um, but we saw it across all categories. So it seems like, you know, the, the whole feature to the market is that you still got a very willing um, uh, guy that does not want to save a, a yearling type heifer. He wants to take the money. And that when I talk to those people, that's, and hey, there's still some people too that are looking at, yeah, rain this year, but you know, one Robin doesn't make it spring. They're not confident at all that they've got a, you know, a, an excess amount of feed supply or grass. Uh, so they're still probably influenced by that as well. So I'll be interested to see that. I'm hoping that maybe the marketing number will be a little bit better than they thought. Um, and, and I guess I'm also already starting to look forward to this January inventory report. If indeed we're placing this many cattle, then we have to have a lot less cattle outside of a feed yard available you know, to be placed. So, uh, you know, again, chasing that carrot around the around the grandstand here, you know, long term, it still looks to me like we still got a tight supply. Well, you know, the carrot turns into the turkey of next week. Uh, we work past that Thanksgiving holiday and that, that one turkey day. What do you see for this market as we get ready to hit the month of December? Well, it probably leads into what a typical, you know, and I feel like I should give you the disclaimer, right? Seasonals are only seasonals. And if all you trade are the seasonals, you go broke, okay? Um, um, <clears throat> but, you know, the seasonality of the market here at this time of year is, is if you think about it, it makes sense. Um, so the North makes up 25, 30% of the total overall supply of the cattle because of the seasonality of sp spring calving, right? Um, so you, you go into different supply you, this time of year, typically we're finishing up on the big calf run and we're not, don't have any yearlings fat yet. Um, from a demand standpoint, you got a little lull here because of what you just described, um, you know, with the Thanksgiving holiday, um, not a beef traditional deal. Uh, but then when you get on about now already, now, you know, for someone that's going to procure the meat for after Thanksgiving, he's looking two or three or four weeks ahead, right? And the demand, as I'm told, has still been very, very good for the middle meats, the high price stuff going into the holidays, you listen to on, on TV of what they expect, you know, the, the shopping deal this year, they're expecting record stuff, right? I mean, I mean, so the, the, we'll see. I think as we move into the holiday period, we're going to see very, very good domestic demand. So there you get into that seasonality of sometime during the first part of December, typically you're, you're tighter on supply because the calves are gone, the yearlings aren't fed, you're going into a better demand period. And and yeah, if you looked at the seasonal book, you'd say you'd see that 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 normally by the end of the first week of December, the market is bottomed and turned higher. I, yeah, you talked about in your little prelude there about um, uh, that's about a week ahead of my birthday, so that's the joke around here. So a week before my birthday, you gotta you know, pay attention. So. Inflationary concerns. What do you have for these? Looking at the news of the week, CPI. Um, you know, as a factor, certainly here in our markets, uh, the sharply the sharp up in the um, stock market, the, the 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 sharp break in the bonds. Uh, you know, all uh, you know, telling you that maybe just maybe, you know, uh, what's happening here is we aren't going to see any rate hikes, and of course, that's a reflection of how the economy is slowing. Uh, they got the rates high enough that we're going like, oh, yeah, I'm not going to build a new factory. I'm not going to buy a bunch more cattle. I'm not going to you know, the list goes on and on, right? I mean, you're not going to borrow a bunch of money when you got to pay eight and a half percent interest. And so things slow down. Now, um, the stock market for now likes that because they don't want to hear about any more rate hikes, but this is, this is means that we're getting a slowdown. So hopefully the inflation thing slows down. I, you know, this week, all week, putting gas in the pickup, it's under three bucks where I live, you know? So, I mean, that's, that's lower. Uh, uh, so let's hope that we calm that and, and notice that we haven't talked about geopoliticals today. It's kind of nice too, you know, not that that, is over, but it does seem like we're not talking about it as much either the Ukraine or the Middle East thing. So, um, but yeah, that can change in a heartbeat. Um, but the cattle thing today, I think back to the bottom line of the deal, cash got better. We saw a bunch of panic selling last week and I get it. You do what you got to do, but we're getting bid 180, even a little 181 in my backyard today. That's five to $6 better than what some cattle were traded at at Friday and futures are discounted. So I, you know, I, I, I we trade a little it seems a little more sensible today to me instead of that, oh, it's going to zero type of mentality that we had. You know, we broke $23, $24. That's about what we broke after mad cow disease, for goodness sakes. You know, yeah. so it's about enough, I think. Let's get some positive moved our way, right? You got it.
What's the best way for folks to get a hold of you, Brad? Well, 800-358-3047 works. Uh, or if you want to learn a little more about us, kkbtrading.com is a good place to, to start. Thanks for having All right. me. Thank you. We'll catch you right before Turkey Day, which should be Beef Day, right? I'll Next be here. Week. All right. Sounds good. As we always remind you, commodity futures and options do involve a substantial risk of loss not suitable to all investors. And that's been this week's Cattle Call on the Rural Radio Network.